I, uh, I love this city. Um, I love red wine. I, um, I love my wife, my kids. I love, uh, I love the beach. I've got a, a beautiful son. I think he was right back here. This is... I'm going to... I'm going to tell you some really embarrassing things about myself, and I thought I would be more endearing if you knew that I had a kid that cute. I, um, <laughs> there are a few things I hate, not many. I love, I love great cuisine, uh, great coffee as well. Um, I, not man, many things I hate, but I hate the Chicago Cubs. Um, <laughs> I, I don't really believe they're a baseball team. I believe they're a cult, and um, they have goat ritual sacrifices. There are very weird things that happen there in Chicago. Um, I, I hate religion. Um, and, and that's a bit problematic for me in so many ways because I make my living as a pastor. Um, I, I fear in so many ways religion because religion uh, can often bring out the worst in us. And when I talk about religion, I mean the uh, the attitudes that say we're going to live by rules that often don't make sense in the context of the rest of life. I, I think that the attitudes that say I'm allowed to look down on someone else or believe somehow I'm better than them because of what I believe. And, and I believe that the problem with religion is the same problem that we have in our city, um, in, uh, in our understanding of history or lack of understanding of history, uh, in our own families, and I think in our own personal crises that often we value and we focus on propositions and facts rather than stories. Propositions lead us to arrogance. They lead us down a road that's often not helpful. And I'm not against propositions if they're rooted in the context of a story. So for you and I, when we talk a little bit about who we are, right, we, we do it in the context of a greater story that when we're aware of that story, it brings great humility. And I believe the same is the case when it comes to religion. If we begin to live into that story more, more fully, uh, we'd be in better shape. It's why I often get in trouble in religious circles. I, I see the sacred and... Uh, a show on a mob boss on HBO and uh, in an ABC series, Lost, and I see it uh, in the environment and at the beach and in so many beautiful and remarkable places. I, um, in my journey, I began to understand religion in a different context. I think when I, I had a, a life-changing experience with my grandfather. My dad and my grandfather on my mother's side are both Baptist pastors, and um, that... It, it's a unique thing to grow up in those homes. My grandfather pastored a church here in Houston and is very much one of those like uh, hellfire kind of preachers. You know, he'd turn up the, the heat in the room actually um, <laughs> as he'd preach on hell, right? Because it would, and, and I remember as a small kid, I, I was really, really intimidated, almost scared uh, in some ways of my own grandfather and just the whole persona. I remember being called out in services for. Uh, giggling and talking and being, you know, just a mess in general. And, and I, I'll, I'll never forget the day that that changed for me. I, um, I was 16 years old and my car wouldn't start. I was staying with him and I was headed off to work. And, uh, and he let me drive his new car. He got a new Oldsmobile 98, if you know anything about Oldsmobiles. The 98's much better than the 88. And, and it was a diesel, and it was brand new, and he let me drive it to work because my car wouldn't start. And it all went really well. I went to work. I came home, totally uneventful. Somehow I was distracted at the very tail end of pulling into his driveway. And I'm not sure what happened, but I kind of ran into the house. Um, <laughs> and... And I caught the faucet, right? I caught the faucet on the edge, and so water is spraying. And, and I, I call him, and I'm like, Pop, I need you to, I need you to come home um, and call a plumber. Um, and, and I'll never forget, I was standing in the driveway, and um, my hands, you know, just shaking. I couldn't stop them as I see him coming down the driveway, and I just think he's going to give it to me. You know, he's just... He's got every right to give it to me. I, I mean, I ran into the house, you know. <laughs> and I'll never forget, he, he touched my shaking hand, and he kissed me on the forehead, and he said, son, it's just a thing. It's just a car. It's okay. And he told me that day, I value and I love you more than I love things. And I began to relate to him. And now he's a pushover, you know. <laughs> I mean, if my kids do that, they're going to get it, right? It's, uh, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And, 
And I'm afraid that for most of us, we've lived into this understanding of much of the world based on propositions. And, and the fear for many is that if we let go of the propositions, we're left with nothing. One of my favorite poets, uh, a New York beat poet named Taylor Molly, he uh, was a public school teacher who became uh, a poet, which is a great career transition probably. And he, he wrote a poem, I don't know if you've ever heard it, it's called Totally Like Whatever You Know. Anybody familiar with it? He, he, Taylor Molly says it this way, he says, in case you hadn't noticed, it has somehow become uncool to sound like you know what you're talking about or believe strongly in what you're like saying. <laughs> Invisible question marks and parenthetical you knows. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Have been attaching themselves to the ends of our sentences even when those sentences are not like questions. Declarative sentences, so-called because they used to, you know, like, declare things to be true, as opposed to things that are totally not, have been infected by this tragically cool and totally hip interrogative tone. You know? <laughs> as if to say, don't think I'm uncool just because I noticed this, okay? I'm nothing personally invested in my own opinions. I'm just asking you to join me on the bandwagon of my own uncertainty. <laughs> what has happened to our conviction? Where are the limbs out from which we once walked? Have they been, like, chopped down with the rest of the rainforest? You know? Or do we just have, like, nothing to say? Has society become so conflicted by these feelings of, yeah, that we've just gotten to the point where we're the most aggressively inarticulate generation to come along since, like, a long time ago? <laughs> so, I implore you, I entreat you, I challenge you to speak with conviction to say what you mean in a manner that bespeaks the determination to which you believe it. Because contrary to the wisdom of the bumper sticker, it's not enough these days just to question authority. you got to speak with it too. Ted, I'm, I'm calling you into a life that I believe is filled with propositions that declare great truths, but that are rooted in the sense of story that brings humility and it draws people together rather than pull them apart. One of the things they ask you to do when you give a TED Talk, there's a lot of things I like about it. I got really unnerved last night about giving a TED Talk, and fortunately you can watch a TED Talk about how to give a good TED Talk, and that, <laughs> that helped a lot. Um, and so I did. But one of the things they say is, is to be revealing, and so I'm really embarrassed to tell you one of the... I, I, I'm not embarrassed easily, and, uh, and there are not a lot of things that I'm ashamed of. But when I get together with family, they have a few things they mock me about, and this is the one that will make me blush, and that's why I can't believe I'm telling you. But I'm wondering if some of you might have the tendency to do the same. I have um, a bit of an affliction, I would say. I'm going to give it a name today. We're calling it the Mockingbird Syndrome. This is, uh, this is the tendency to very poorly mimic the sounds, accents, and inflection of the person one is addressing. <laughs> if this mimicry was not wholly unintentional, it would be utterly offensive <laughs> and entirely reprehensible. Maybe someone in your family also has this affliction. When I'm at my favorite sushi restaurant, I often say, Escalar, please, like really in a way that the waitress looks at me thinking, what is wrong with you? Can you not speak English, right? I, um, I, I, I noticed even when I call Citibank and I'm listening to their robotic person and they tell me to say my card number, I start speaking like a robot to them as if that would help them. When I'm on technical support, I have this strange Indian accent and I, I don't want to have it, but I, I have it. I try to stop. I have... I have this one friend in East Texas, and um, <laughs> I recommend that all of us should have no more than one friend from East Texas. <laughs> and when I speak with him on my phone, my wife always knows who it is because I talk like I'm, I think I'm talking like I'm from East Texas. Whether we're trying to imitate someone's accent or we're, many of us are songwriters, right? Or you dabble or you write poetry. And, we write a song and then we realize like, oh, Bob Dylan already wrote that song. Like I, 
I didn't realize it's the same chord progression and very similar lyrics. And we spend much of our life imitating, imitating others. And I think we, many of us, and I hope today could be one of those moments for you where we have a unique experience that calls us to live into our own story rather than trying to imitate someone else's. Johnny Cash, one of my favorite artists, had this kind of experience. It, and it tells the story quite well in the Walk the Line movie. If you hadn't seen it, you should just go watch it. I, I watch it regularly. And Johnny Cash goes in to Sam Phillips, this great producer found Elvis. I mean, he's the guy, right? And he goes in to play his music, and he starts playing his music, and he's playing gospel music, saying, I'm a gospel artist. And um, he doesn't get six bars in, and Sam says, stop, done, that's it. And Johnny starts to argue with him, and he says, listen, if you don't have anything else, we're done. And you can see the wheels turning in Johnny Cash's head. Sam Phillips asked him this question. It's part of what I ask you today. He said, first, I, really, I don't believe you. The song you were singing, it doesn't seem authentic. It doesn't seem real. It doesn't sound like you. Some of you need to hear that. The work that you're doing, what you're writing, who you are. People just say, that's not really you. You're imitating somebody else. I don't know who it is, but you're imitating them. And I wonder who you really are. And he asked Johnny Cash this question. He said, if you had one song to sing to tell the world who you are, one song, what would it be? And in that moment, you watch the film, you, you see it. You see a man come from being an appliance salesman who went door to door, mimicking a sales pitch, to being a truth teller. Johnny Cash doesn't, I mean, he's got a great voice, but, and it, but he's not the greatest guitarist, not the greatest musician, but he told the truth, right? He was who he, who he was, no doubt about it. And the world is crying out for most of us to live into that same story. I believe that when we lose our focus on the propositions, the facts about who we are, where we come from, and we begin to truly enter into our own story. One of the things we do in our, our community here in Houston, we have people tell their story, their brokenness, their ugliness, and they begin to lay it out there. And what happens is it's remarkable. When they have an evening over a great meal to tell their story to others, they begin to own it in a new way. They begin to find their voice. I think in many ways, like Johnny Cash found his voice. My curiosity comes for us when we begin to look at our own history. This is a, a, a painting of my, uh, my great-grandfather. We call him Pappy. He has a name, but I don't even know it. He's just Pappy to me. <laughs> and Granny, they were Houstonians. Uh, my dad was raised by his grandfather because his dad died in the Korean War six weeks after he was born. My Pappy, I, I have great memories of him. Um, as a young kid, you couldn't ask for anybody better. He was a one-armed truck driver. Um, I don't know if you've ever known a one-armed truck driver, but when you're four years old, that's the coolest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and um, my pappy, I remember, uh, he, had, he drove a dump truck with a stick in the middle, right, where you could, uh, b before power steering existed. And, um, and I used to just sit in my pappy's. He sat on the porch a lot. I used to sit in his lap on the porch and play with his stub, you know, and I just... <laughs> sit there and play with it like a kid, like who didn't quite have the words to be like, Pappy, what happened to your arm, right? I, and I remember I finally got old enough to ask, like, Pappy, what, what's the deal? And I asked, and it was it, silence, right? It became really clear this was like a family secret, something we didn't talk about. In recent years, I was working on a book, and I got to dig in and, and finally ask. We went to my aunt's sister. She probably has a name, too. I don't know. We just call her aunt's sister. And, and so... <laughs> We go to Aunt Sister to say, what happened to Pappy's arm, right? And as the story goes, he was in a bar, a bar over on Mid Lane, when that was like way out in this city, right, at the far extremes. And, um, and he got in a fight with a man about the way this man was treating a woman. And um, he didn't like it. He told him. They got in a fight. My Pappy whooped him. He thought the guy left, but the guy went out to his car. He got a gun. He came back in, and he shot my Pappy's arm off, right? At that point, we're going, wow. You know, just what? Well, apparently then my pappy takes his good arm, he picks the guy up, he throws him against a brick wall, and he kills him. We're hearing the story, we're thinking, well, I just thought it was a train accident or something, you know? I'm like, I, I went home, I, I told my wife, and I don't think I told anybody else for a while, I didn't even, we didn't really speak of the story, we are just like, what? I mean, every now and then I'd be negotiating a book deal with a publisher, they would throw out a number, and I'd say, let me tell you about my pappy, right? <laughs> You know, we got a history in my family of killing people with one arm. And 
they'd always come back with a better offer. I was like, this works great. Um, but it, it took me a long time to realize that what happened on, in this bar on mid lane wasn't just some separate thing. It was my story, right? My pappy influenced my dad. He was the main role model for my dad. And after that day, he never spoke of anything meaningful, emotional, anything else. He shut down. And he shaped who my dad became more than anyone else. No one shaped who I am more than my dad. And I began to realize what happened in that bar on mid lane affects who I am today. My tendency to go home from this event and talk to my wife about it or not talk about it. It's my story. Right? When we look at the story of this city, one that's been innovative and progressive, where the world has come to us, we will live well if we live into that story. As we look at our own story, our failures, our mistakes, right? the things that we've done absolutely wrong and absolutely right, the best way, we're asking this question, how do we go forward? How we go forward is we better understand our past. Right? It, you look at the major crisis in our world, this divide between Christianity and Islam, it's, it's, if there's an apocalypse, this will be the, the, the reason, right? If we want an answer to this story, we have to go back. We've got to look at who we are. We share a common story. We, we have so much in common, way more in common than we have that divides us. And if we look back in history, we'll begin to find it. Ted, I believe the reason Johnny Cash became who he was, the reason that most of us have the opportunity to become someone unique, someone that tells the truth, that has clarity in times of tumult and struggle and violence is because we best understand our global story, our history, and our personal story. I hope you'll join me on that journey. God bless you. Thanks for letting me share with you.